Welcome everyone. You're about to see a few interviews about the apparent murder of Ian Jacobs from Birmingham. His friend Mick Locke and the journalist Sue Buchanan both give their accounts in this initial five minute clip. Boyne Annesley appears first. As Boyne looked deeper into what happened to Chrissy, he discovered more and more unexplained deaths. I think when I'd been there maybe eight or nine months, there was a rumour going around the island that the guy called Ian Jacobs had been found dead. And the whisper was he'd been murdered. On the 2nd of January 2000, 36-year-old Ian Jacobs from Birmingham headed out to Koh Tao to enjoy a diving holiday. Ian liked to have a laugh. We'd met at college and we had quite a few adventures together. The last night we spent together was Millennium Night in Bristol. Me and Ian decided to rent a burger van and we made tomato soup and bacon butties and sold cider. Yeah, we made quite a bit of money out of it and basically that was our pocket money to go travelling. He went to Thailand, I went to India. I just arrived in India. I checked my emails and there was an email just saying that he'd died. I went to his cremation in Bangkok and decided then to go down to Koh Tao. He was found at the bottom of a well and he died to a blow to the head. The pull was purely to find out if it was possible by accident to fall in this well. I wanted to put any doubt in my mind to bed that he had been murdered. I went to take some photos of this well, only to discover that it had been completely bulldozed over. There was no well anymore. I went to see the police to ask why there was no money amongst his personal possessions, and they said that they'd taken the money to pay for his, the shipment of his body back to the mainland and the chief of police said, there's a ferry leaving in the morning. You need to be on it, which was a not very veiled threat. If he didn't go away voluntarily, he would have been pushed. Can you remember seeing his body? I went down to have a look, and it was not a well. It was just a, it was a concrete circle they used for wells, but this one was just on the floor. I think people even use it as a rubbish bin, actually. There's no feasible way that guy could have ended up falling off his bike, throwing himself into the fetal position and inserting himself in this piece of concrete. You know, someone else said to me, Sue, there's something wrong here. This is a cover-up. The fact that Sue says, there was no water involved, kind of explains why the autopsies came up with completely different results. There was an autopsy in Copan Gang, which said that he had drowned, completely differs from the autopsy report in Bangkok, which makes no mention of water in any way, shape or form. The police report confirmed my views about what had happened. The police lieutenant says it's believed that the cause of death was most likely because the tourist lost his way or on his way to urinate and happened to fall down into the well. The next witness says it's believed that the cause of death was that the man was drunk or on his way to urinate. The next witness says the witness believed that the cause of death was because the man was drunk and on his way to urinate but unfortunately fell into the well. Um, all very similar. Did they really say that? Or were those words put into their mouths? I'm thinking that's all just made up. 
we're not going to just sit quietly in the background and let it fade away. I know we'll never find or get justice, but there's never been any doubt in my mind that he was murdered. Welcome, everyone. Today on uh, the channel, I've got a special guest from England. His name is Mick Locke, and he's got a story about his friend Ian Jacobs, who died on Kotal on or about the 15th of January 2000, so over 21 years ago now. But he's uh, got a story about his highly suspicious death, which we both think was a, uh, a murder. So welcome to the channel, Mick. Hi. Hi. Uh, okay, well, would you like to start your story uh, perhaps back at the very beginning of January 2000 and we'll take it from there? Yeah, um, me and Ian were best friends, I suppose, living in Bristol at the time. Yes. Um, on the 3rd of January, I took him to Heathrow. He flew to Thailand to go and do a diving course on Koh Tao. I flew to India about two weeks later. Um, soon after arriving in India, I was heading up to the Himalayas. I got an email from a mutual friend saying that he died, uh, saying that he'd been found at the bottom of a well and that he died from a blow to the head. I think that's the story we got at the time. Uh, there was everybody assumed, all his friends, there, there were a big group of us mutual friends in Bristol that it was suspicious. There was never any doubt in our minds at the very beginning, it was, it was dodgy. So I then flew to Thailand to go to his cremation. Uh, he was cremated at the Temple of the Golden Buddha, very famous temple in Bangkok. There's uh -huh. a picture there. Yep. The largest golden Buddha in the world, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so while I was there in Bangkok, I decided to go down to Koh Tao. Yes. Uh, this must have been probably, a couple, we're talking a couple of weeks now after he died, I guess. I can't remember the dates exactly. Yep. Uh, not to stir anything up, but I just wanted to see. I mean, my main concern, I think, was to see whether it was possible for someone to fall into this well accidentally, because, of course, none of us believed it. But I wanted to make sure. So that's what I did. Went to Koh Tao, only stayed there four or five days, I think. Um, was shown the well that we were told he died in. More of that later. OK, who showed um, you the well? I can't remember. I, I honestly can't remember. It's 20 years ago. But was it the police or was it um, other people on the island? I don't think it was the police. I think it was other people on the island. OK. I'm pretty sure. And there was some uh, discussion because we've had, uh, we've exchanged uh, some tweets and some messages in the past. And sometimes the place of death has been referred to as a well. Sometimes it's been referred to as a um, prefabricated concrete pipe that you think that you know maybe it was a well um, that was constructed of prefabricated concrete pipe. Is that the story? Yeah, I mean, this, this came. Well, this is this is jumping forward because yes. okay. for twenty years I believe that he was found at the bottom of a well with water yes. in it. Okay. Uh, in the space of the past year, I've spoken to someone, an eyewitness on the island, who saw his body the day it was found, yes. and says he was found in. A, a disused well a, yes. a, and the wells in Thailand are made out of concrete piping. I'll show you a photo here. Thanks. Concrete drainage channels which are buried horizontally into the ground. Um, now the eyewitness says there was no water in the well he was found in. In fact it was full of mud and litter almost up to ground level. It was only like a couple of foot, feet deep basically. Whereas the well I was shown on the island was a deep well with water in the bottom. And for 20 years, I believe this was his place of death. And the police reports all say he was found at the bottom of a well with water in it. And mm -hmm. basically they found. Um, so anyway, so I went to look at this well, found the well, shown the well, decided it was pretty much impossible to either walk into it because it had the well had a lip and you would not be able to just walk into it, nor if you stumbled over it, would you fall in it? You would fall across it. Uh, the, the, the aperture wasn't big enough for someone to trip and fall and fall down into the well. So any remaining suspicion that it might have been an accident was expelled from 
my mind. Um, there was no doubt. You either jumped in the well or somebody put you in it. Okay. Um, I went to see the police while I was there. I, again, I didn't go in there, stir up any fuss. I was too scared, really. Um, I asked what had happened to his money because I know he'd had money. And when his possessions were returned, there was no money. They told me to, that the money had been used to transport his body to the mainland. And that's why they, the police had kept the money. Um, and they asked me to return to see them in a couple of days time when the chief of police who carried out the investigation, um, the chief of police from the Copan gang, the neighboring island would be there. I returned uh, to the police station. On the way, I went to take some photos of the, the well, the scene of the crime, only to discover the whole area had been completely bulldozed. Um, there was no well to be found. It was okay. Just when, when you say it was bulldozed, um, are there? It was a bulldozer, but there was no well. Okay. The whole landscape had been filled in. It was been filled in. And yeah. you know, you can see something had been going on. Okay. Now, yeah. you didn't actually possible. see a bulldozer, though, did you? It was no, a, no, I didn't. You saw, saw the um, it, it was my impression was that they destroyed the scene of the crime. Yeah. Okay. Um, although, to be fair, if the body is found in a well, you wouldn't want people drinking from it, so you would probably no. fill it in. But yeah. um, it was suspicious to me. Mm. So anyway, then I went to the police um, and the chief of police from Copan Gang. I can't remember the course of the conversation, but the only one thing I do remember him saying to me is, there is a boat leaving in the morning. You should be on it. Yes. Um, which I took as a, a not very veiled threat. Uh, yeah. It was enough to put the, put the willies up me quite, yes. quite severely. And I think I did leave the next day. Um, and do you have any theories of your own or uh, any reason uh, for any motive for someone, anyone to kill him? No, I don't. I really don't. Um, it could have been a mugging. I mean, I had my suspicions earlier. I'm not going to go into them because I don't okay. know. At the time, there was a story about him lending to money to someone on the island who was setting up a bar. Um, and we thought possibly this guy had had done him in but i don't think that's okay very feasible i think the chances are he was very he, when he got drunk he was very cheeky um it's very possible that he was cheeky to someone in the bar that mm. night and you know how ties are with the idea of face yes. who knows yes. i mean we know we know now know that there's some pretty psychopathic people on that island yes. so who knows what happens he might have been mugged yes if he'd have been mugged he would have he would have put up resistance because he was that sort of guy he wouldn't have he would have you know fought back yes for being bashed over the head um, yes well in fact I, I do hear these little anecdotes from time to time of uh people whether it's on Koh Tao or the neighboring island of Koh Pangang you know a lot of people are interrelated between the two islands yeah but you, you'll have stories of you know two Thai men getting into an argument one person says to the other um fuck you or fuck your mother and then the person who's received the insult walks away, comes back five minutes later with a pistol and shoots the uh, other fellow dead in front of a huge crowd of people. And the whole thing just, you know, payments are made to the police. No one's ever charged. No one ever goes to court. And the witnesses all just tend to think, well, uh, the fellow who dished out the insult had it coming. It doesn't really take a lot for one person to murder another on these islands. They are very, um, there are some very violent communities uh, behind all of the smiles there. So look, I'm sorry for interrupting, but uh, yes, I just thought I'd put those two cents worth in. Um, okay, so you left the island and now a lot of people who are watching this are going to ask questions like, well, okay, if all of this supposedly happened back in 2000, why didn't um, Mick Lock uh, make a big fuss with either the British police or the British media on his return to England. So what, what's your answer to them? Um, well, uh, Ian was a really popular guy. Um, his friends held a wake for him in Bristol, massive yes. event, Under, hundreds of people turned up, including his parents. I, uh, I was still in Asia, so I didn't go. But on returning to England, the, the consensus was that the parents believed, didn't, the, the consensus was the parents didn't want people to interfere or to make a fuss. 
they believed the accident story, the story that it was an accident and fallen in the well. Um, and therefore we decided out of respect for them that we would not take it any further. We had friends in Thailand who said that they would, they could report it, would, you know, get stories in the Bangkok Post or whatever, but we decided not to follow that up. And for 15, 16 years since then, yes. I've let it live for that very reason. Yes. Um, it was only several years ago, uh, I was going on holiday to Scotland. She lives five minutes from the airport. And basically I've, ne I've never met, I had never met his parents, but we used to send each other Christmas cards yes. after we didn't die. That was the only contact we had. Yes. Um, but I, I'd never met them. His father then died. Um, I was flying to Scotland. I decided I'd pop in and see her. She said, yeah, great. I popped in. I wasn't, again, I wasn't gonna really bring up the subject, but we got talking. Um, and eventually I said, what happened? What do you think happened to Ian? She said, oh, he was murdered. Straight away, matter of fact. Okay. Uh, um, so then I said, okay, well, that's what we all think. Do you mind if the story gets publicized? She said, no, absolutely not. You go ahead. So from that point onwards, I've been talking to you about it. Um, I got in touch with Tom Stone, who made the Death in Paradise documentary. I mean, a lot oh, of it all came... It was actually, that was called Murder in Paradise. That was Murder a channel for... Yep. Yep. Um, to be honest, a lot of this all came back to light after Hannah and David got murdered because yes. it became an issue. Yes. And it only then I started discovering about how many other people had met mysterious deaths in Koh Tao. And even though I know nothing, justice will never be served, it seems relevant to bring it up, really. I mean, I, I, I felt bad that the story about Ian had been buried all these years. Yes. So I'm quite happy for it to be publicised just mm. so that you know he was murdered. Yeah. because he was. Well, in fact, just for a bit of a more of a timeline for the viewers, uh, I've got a record that on the 17th of May 2016, uh, you sent me a direct message through my Twitter feed and that for some weeks before then, uh, you had been leaving little notes under some of my tweets. So uh, that's uh, about the time that you and I have been in contact with each other. And I, I largely sat on the story until uh, you spoke to his mother. And then uh, on the 20th anniversary of uh, Ian Jacob's death, I created this little video here. And I'll put a link to this below, but um, I listed 18 people who had perished on Ko uh, Tao. And the first in this chronological list was uh, Ian Jacobs. And his picture's about to come up now. Hopefully this won't be too blurry, but I'll put a link to this beneath uh, this video in the description below. So that gives a bit more of a timeline. And uh, it seems that uh, since I published that, which was a year and a, well, that was the beginning of 2000, so a year and a half ago now, you've actually found out a bit more information and you've received some documents from Ian's parents. Is that right? I've now received all the police reports, which I haven't seen before yet. Yeah. I have them here now, uh, autopsy reports. Yes. Um, witness statements. And I've looked at them closely and it only increases my feelings that he um, was murdered. There yeah. are two or the start is, well, let's go back to one thing I've also discovered um, it recently within the last year is that the story about him being found in a well with water in it and him drowning is not true. Um, mm -hmm. I've since spoken to an, a witness, an eyewitness who saw his body when it was found, the date it was found. Um, I think it was the 18th of January, according to the police reports. And he was not found in a well. He was found in, well, what we think of is a, as a deserted well mm -hmm. with no water in it, full of mud up to pretty much ground level. And I believe this well, the two wells are close together. I was shown the one with water in it. He was found in the dry well. So the idea that he drowned, which is what the police autopsy report says, I now believe to be um, complete fiction. Um, the police reports give me two autopsies. There's the autopsy from Copangang, which says he drowned. There's another autopsy report from Bangkok when his body arrived in Bangkok, which says he died from a blow to the head um, and internal bleeding. 
in the brain. No mention in the police and the autopsy report from Bangkok of water, which is strange if a body had been found in water for three days, according to the police report, um, you think it would be mentioned. They, so with the autopsy from Copan Gang says the body was bloated, the body was swollen, hair was falling out because it had been in water for three days. Bangkok autopsy report doesn't mention water at all. So whatever the cause of death, you think that would be mentioned. It's not. Um, and, and the witness statements, uh, if I could just read out some of the witness statements, this is what makes me, you know, it's suspicious. So the witnesses um, all pretty much say exactly the same thing. <laughs> which is somewhat suspicious. The, the police officer in charge says, it's believed that the cause of death was most likely because the tourist lost his way or on his way to urinate and happens to fall down into the well and his head hit the mouth of the well before falling into the well, the cause of death, okay? Second witness says, I believe the cause of death was that the man was drunk on his way to urinate, the edge of the well was low, the man didn't notice it and fell into the well. It's most likely he couldn't climb up since he's drunk and finally dead. Next witness, believed that the cause of the death was because the man was drunk and on his way to urinate, but unfortunately fell into the well, dug by villagers and died. The next witness, cause of death was likely from drinking liquor and drunk, villagers saw him drunk and most villagers believed the man got drunk and fell into the well, unable to climb up and lost his life. And the final witness says, uh, believed that the man drunk liquor and got drunk and fell into the well, dug by villagers to consume water in the dry season. The well is quite deep. The man fell into the well and was able to, unable to climb up and finally lost his life. Now, these aren't witnesses that saw anything. Uh, one is um, the owner of the bungalow where he's staying. Yes. One is a taxi driver that um, almost gave him a lift home the night before. One is the guy that found the body. One is the police chief. And yet they all seem to come out in their independent ways by saying sentences that are almost identical yeah. <laughs> that he was drunk and he went to urinate now how anyone could know that when they weren't even there is suspicious let's say and i think that, very... you, that one of the police reports mentioned that he died from a blow to the head uh so the 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 autopsy from Copangang says that he had he died from drowning Yes. But he had a broken neck. Yes. Um, and they are saying probably from hitting something on the way. So they're trying to claim that he fell into the well and hit his head on the way down. And that is why uh, he had a broken neck. The police report in Bangkok just says he died from a blow to the head, bleeding in the brain due to severe impacts at the head. Okay. According to the actual words. Yeah, I've got in front of me. Well, look, thanks very much for all of that, um, Mick. I think that uh, that's been uh, pretty comprehensive. Uh, one of the things I was just going to mention before uh, we uh, come to the end of the interview is that uh, quite often we have a lot of trolls who watch my channel, uh, trolls who watch my um, Twitter feed, which is Ian Yarwood underscore law, and trolls who watch my or read my Facebook page, which is uh Kotao death island and those trolls will say things like oh if this happened uh, 21 years ago it's old news why are you mentioning it now and one of the things which i just wanted to highlight is that quite often within the mainstream media both in thailand and in britain uh, a lot of the murders and suspicious deaths are completely overlooked so a lot of the crime is understated secondly uh, there was a well-known journalist who was the head of the BBC in Bangkok. His name was Jonathan Head. And immediately after the murders of Hannah and David, he went to Koh Tao and he sent out a couple of uh, television reports. And in, one of his comments from there was uh, he referred to Koh Tao as this normally peaceful island. And he made a couple of other comments that were similar. Uh, now, Jonathan Head had made, uh, he did make a, a, a very good uh, article, he, or he wrote a very good article on the day that the two Burmese men were convicted of the murders of Hannah and David. But I've often found when I look at reports uh, from the mainstream media that they paint Koh Tao as being, um, you know, 
you know, heaven on earth. And in fact, I think that anyone who's paid any attention would know that Koh Tao uh, can be heaven or it can be hell. And anyone who thinks otherwise uh, really is not paying attention. And so, you know, when we've got uh, people like Mick coming forward, as he has kindly done so today, and told us the story about Ian Jacobs' death, you know, we can piece that together with the assassination of Vera Asavachan uh, in 2002. He was known as Mr. Ban, and he created Ban's Diving Resort and Ban's Diving School. And he was assassinated by a lone gunman wearing a balaclava. He was shot six times on Sairi Beach as he was chatting with three friends. And that's reported in the Bangkok Post. Then obviously, of course, we had the uh, murders of uh, Ben Harrington uh, in 2012 and Nick Pearson a short time later. And all of that was before the deaths of Hannah and David. And there were lots of other little anecdotes floating around that the mainstream media didn't always pick up. And of course, in recent weeks, I've um, published two videos on this channel uh, in which I've interviewed Carla Bartel and Sam Venning, who escaped two masked men, <clears throat> excuse me, who attacked them in the very same spot where the bodies of Hannah and David were found. So in answer to all of the trolls who might be asking, um, there are very good reasons why we have uh, Mick Locke coming on the um, channel today to explain what happened uh, 21 years ago. Uh, so look, I thank you again for your time, Mick. And is there anything else you'd like to add or is there anything else that's come to your attention or come to mind as you've been um, speaking today? No, I think that's just about covered it. I'm not happy with that. Okay. Well, no, I, don't have a, I don't have a grudge against Kotao. I just like to make that plain. Um, things happen everywhere in the world. Yes. This is no better against Death Island, but yes. my best mate got killed. And yeah. I want it, the truth to be known. That's basically, yes. that's it. That's okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I think you've done everyone a great service by coming forward. And uh, I, and I think a lot of people will understand that uh, you kept a lid on things for a while, especially when you thought that um, uh, Ian's parents were of the belief that perhaps he did die in an accident and you didn't want to unduly upset them. So, exactly. Yeah. I didn't want to be the one that told them that you know, no. their son had yep. been murdered. Yeah. Could have ruined the rest of their lives. Yes. Well, thank you. Well, thank you again for your time. And uh, look, for all the viewers out there, if you've uh, appreciated um, uh, Mick's interview, please give the video a thumbs up. It does help uh, this YouTube channel and it's just a sign of appreciation for Mick as well. I'm sure he would appreciate it. And, uh, you know, just in, in memory of uh, poor Ian Jacobs, whose life was cut short because he was only 35 years old at the time. Um, so uh, look, thank you again. And uh, please consider subscribing and leaving any comments. Thanks again, Mick, and you, you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks. Cheers, Ian. Cheers. Bye for now.